Okay, here we go with the Bro Staff Bass Class Volume 4. <clears throat> We're going to talk about how to read and, and fish docks, um, basically to make you a better um, prepared for pulling up on a dock and figuring out, first of all, how you should approach it and basically try to get as much fish out of that dock as you can um, the best way possible. We're going to talk about techniques with that, how to read a dock, how to fish a dock, how to choose baits and approaches. And then we're going to dive head first into one of my favorite topics, the bass jig. Um, we're basically going to be breaking down several different jigs into their components and why they are effective and why they are designed the way they are. Um, and then <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about how to fish them, but it's mainly going to be about the jig itself. And everybody fishes jigs differently. They have their own technique, their own comfort level, but I'm going to break down the bait itself and try to get you to a place where you're comfortable choosing jigs for what you want to do and also the conditions you're presented with. So we're going to get started with docks first. And we're going to talk about the basics. The, the five questions that we all ask ourselves without even thinking about it, a lot of the stuff we do while we're on the water, we don't think about it. We just do it in our minds. Um, but if you really break it down, you kind of ask yourself five different questions when you roll up on a dock, whether that be in a boat or a kayak for that matter. You know, first of all, is the dock floating or is it fixed? Um, and, and we're going to go through each of these in depth, but that's the first thing I look at for a dock. And, and you kind of will notice yourself doing that now that you've thought about it, is when you roll up on a dock, you look for the vertical structure. You look for those poles or pillars or you know wooden beams going down because that's typically good structure underneath for the fish to hide around. Um, it also kind of guides you in how you're going to approach it with a lure, whether on top or you know subsurface or on the bottom. Um, you're going to look for what supports are holding the dock up, whether it be fixed or where the floats are and the shade is when it's a floating dock. The next question, I mean, we really think about is whether the dock's deep or shallow. We'll look down at our depth finder. If it's a clear lake, we'll look over towards the shoreline to see how gradual or, or how steep the drop is. And that can kind of also dictate whether you think you should fish that dock and if so, how to approach it with baits and techniques. The season and the water temp as well, basically, if you think about a dock as just another piece of structure, it, are you in a season while you're on that water where that particular dock is in play You know, in your mind? And there are always expectations to every dock, whether it's good or bad, and those can be bucked. You'll catch you know, fish up way shallower than you thought you would in cold weather and then, you know, way deeper in springtime. So <clears throat> all this can be bucked and, and have situations where fish will surprise you, but we're trying to get you on point now to, to figure out how to dial it in better. And seasonality and water temp kind of position the fish into their behaviors, where they're going to be, and they'll use a dock like another piece of cover. What the sky conditions are, whether it's bright and sunny or cloudy, will kind of dictate how tight you really need to fish to that dock or can you spread out a little bit and use it kind of sporadically around the edges of the dock or a little further off the dock between the docks even I have seen as a pattern before on Lake Norman um, where the fish weren't really laid up under the docks they were between them running shad so think about the sky conditions and then whether or not you have actual hard structure under or around that dock brush piles are huge a lot of guys have a hundred waypoints on a lake where the dock has a brush pile under it and they'll just run those docks and they'll fill their limit and they'll beat them up and then they'll rotate through them. So <clears throat> knowing which docks have different structure than all the other ones is key and dredges as well, especially on Lake Norman where you have a lot of shallow gradual water at the lower end of the lake and a lot of houses with a lot of docks. Those people that have those boats they're going to have some dredges down there so they can get in and out. And we'll talk about how to look at those as well. So let's get into it. With a fixed dock like this one, um, you can see great cover, you know, huge gazebo style area or covered area out front. The boat stalls are obviously usually covered to protect the boats. And then you have all these vertical pilings everywhere. I mean, this is gold. Um, it's the kind of stuff I look for when I'm skipping baits when I'm fishing baits on the bottom, when I'm fishing drop baits like a wacky rig Cinco or a slow falling worm or what have you. But 
that's that's a really really good looking fixed dock in my opinion and then you look at the floating docks so typically the floating docks like this one will have a, a walkway that comes out that's able to bevel because with this floating dock as the water level rises and falls the walkway has to follow the dock so there's typically not a fixed pole in the middle of the walkway in the water that would inhibit this walkway from rising and falling with the dock so you really only have a little bit of structure going vertical into the water if any this thing looks like it doesn't have anything that goes all the way to the bottom it's all floating and again that's to help with the rise and fall of the lake this dock's not going to go underwater so with a fixed dock and this is just my opinion this is how i feel like the fish are laid up whatever season whatever lake you're on those fish want to be around cover and in this one i displayed a boat being in the middle I feel like that's an area nobody remembers at the end of the dock is that you can still skip a bait under that boat hole and there's plenty of shade there. So, excuse me, that is an area also where if your fish are on a reactive bite where they're looking up and hitting fall baits, that can also be a, a good spot to check as well. But obviously the vertical cover is key for me. That's what I'm going to look for. That's what I'm going to expect these bass to be relating to, whether looking out, looking in, looking up, or looking down. So <clears throat> one thing though, when you're fooling with fixed docks is watch out for your cross members. And most of the time, the cross member that, you'll, that you won't see that gets you the most is actually in the boat stall. And it's deeper than you think because it has to have room to let that boat in and out. Whether there's a lift there or not, the support cross beam in that boat stall will typically be out of sight. You'll feel it when your jig hangs up on it and you're frustrated and you thought it was a fish hitting it on the rise when you're pulling a jig up. But most of the time, if there's going to be one there you can't see, that's it. Now the other two, the X bars as I call them, those are usually visible above the water line or just at it. And those are adding support to the, to the platforms up there keeping you know vertical stability of the wood with the pillars. And those you can skip around, you can hop around, you know, throw a bait, throw a jig through it. But you better be careful because if you get a fish on the other side of him, he's got a lot of doors to come out to wrap you up in. And I've had it happen to me personally countless times. It's funny, but it's not, <laughs> especially if it's a big fish. But it, it, it's something to think about. Now, don't not fish the dock if it's got cross members, but just be wary that you, your chances of getting him out of there if you go through one of those X's are pretty small. But anyway usually though that vertical cover will hold more fish too so it's a it's a give and take relationship floating docks in my opinion this is how the bass are going to lay up to them you see there's nothing vertical to hold the fish they got these black floats they got the boat they got shade from those objects but nothing below them and bass like to have something other around them to hunker up against they're not going to want to be out in the open only reason they do that if they're cruising to eat or if they're schooling on fish together so most of the time, the residential fish you catch around docks ain't going to be just out in the middle. They're going to be tucked up next to some cover so they can ambush their prey. In my head, when I roll up on a floating dock, this is what I'm looking for. And when the shad spawn is going on around here in May, sometimes in June, most of the time it's May, they will be laid up all over these black floats because those black floats grow more algae. And the shad will be peeling off that algae as they spawn. And a lot of guys who are throwing a white jig, a white swim bait, a white spinner bait, in May, early in the morning when those shad are spawning, they will drive past 15 fixed docks to go find these floating docks, especially if they're around riprap. Because riprap also holds algae, and that's where the shad are going to spawn. So, little key there with floating docks as not sexy as they might be as a, as a standard you know fixed dock with poles the shad really really get drawn to these black floats so keep that in mind when you're looking at a floating dock especially in may around here in north carolina so from the top down looking at a fixed dock these are all the different options typically that you have when you're approaching it to look at vertical cover a lot of people forget about the walkway. I don't, especially if it's in springtime or fall, early in the morning, late in the evening, and I'm throwing a topwater or a shallow water bait. That's the, the, the last piece of cover before it goes to dirt that the fish can use. And sometimes the big fish will be up there, especially if the guy has put Christmas trees out 
He's not going to put them out on the big dock where his boat is. He might run over them. He might scratch his boat up. He might hang up on them while he's fishing. But he may want to have some type of structure around his dock for his youngins to come out there and catch some brim, catch some crappy. Most of the time, he's going to walk down that walkway and drop it right at the back of the dock. So next time you're hunting for a dock and trying to figure out if there's brush around it, don't forget to sneak around back and look at the walkway. You may see some ropes hanging down. You may see some little stems sticking up. That's a good place for most homeowners to drop their Christmas trees. Ergo, a brush pile to hold a big fish that wants to feed on brim, especially in May and June when post spawn is going on. Anyway, when you're looking at your poles, all these circles on this map are typically where you have the most functional poles. They're able to be skipped. They're able to be fished down the side of. They're able to be approached from any angle you want. And it's an easy way to find them. Now, yes, there will be poles in the middle supporting the walkway, supporting the boat lift. But these are the guys on the outside that you know the dock is going to have to have. The corners, the fronts, the boat stalls. So this is an easy way. If you're trying to get on a pattern on a dock that's repeatable, this is the most basic structure system you'll see in a fixed dock. And you can plan your attack accordingly. Whereas, with this picture, you have your floating dock. And typically, this is what you see. You'll have a walkway come out, whether it's supported or not, on a hinge or not, however that works. Different lakes have different styles for that. But more often than not, at the bottom of the picture of the dock there, you'll have that gap for that boat stall. And it could be on the left, right, or the front, hardly ever in the back. But you will have a gap somewhere. And sometimes these docks don't have roofs. More often than not, this is a cheaper way out. Another cheaper way out is to not add a roof. So a lot of docks, especially the ones on Norman, like the big public marina docks, where if you live here, you can have a slip. You'll see a lot of floating docks with very few vertical supports, but they'll have little slips. And if you've got a decent little pattern going where the fish are hunkering up on those black floats, you can run marina docks all day as long as you can figure out that pattern. So... Typically, I'm going to look to fish the floats, I'm going to skip something into that boat slip, and check the walkway, and keep going. So, that's kind of what you're looking at from a floating dock. The next question is about depth. So, when you look at the dock, both of these pictures are the same dock, just to kind of show you, you know, a mirror image of, of on the left there, the dock, you know, the, the water under the dock up at the banks a foot all the way out to the front of the docks five foot versus the other side it's three to fifteen so while they look the same the depth of the water will change your perception of both of these docks so that one to five footer that's a dock in the back of a cove on a shallow point things like that not on the main channel not on the main creek channel you're going to fish that dock a little bit differently than you would the one on the right which looks like it's on a main beam it's on a, the front creek channel it's a lot deeper the way you break down a dock based on its depth will kind of guide your bait selections, your technique selections, and how close or far away from the dock you also want to be, which we're going to talk about. With a shallow dock, this is just me, but I broke it all the way down to how I would approach a shallow dock. I'm going to want, if I'm throwing a falling bait, a slower falling bait. Whether that means you have to have a lighter weight, a weightless bait, or a bait that's a little heavier because you want to skip further with some action in the tail, which will slow the fall down, whatever. But you're only going to be dropping five feet on this dock, even all the way out at the front. So you don't want it to necessarily plummet to the bottom every time you pitch. So think about that with falling baits. If you're pitching a jig, if you're skipping a shaky head, things like that, try to make it stay hung in that column as much as you can because there ain't much column there and you don't have to go far so be able to present that bait to the fish for as long as possible can really help especially when it's tough top water on shallow docks is more feasible because the fish only have to come up five feet in this case so you could throw a spook pop bar buzz bait anything you wanted down the front of this dock and still not be out of the realm of possibility for them to come up and get it now granted when you're throwing top water around a dock, obviously right up near the bank is going to be pretty shallow water. The fish can see the bait, hear the bait, feel the bait, and they'll come get it. But on deeper docks, usually out front, you're not going to have quite as many fish committed to come up 15 feet and grab a bait. But five feet ain't nothing, so they'll come up easy to come get that if they're on that particular bait. So top water is much, much more feasible at a shallow dock than it could be at, say, a much deeper dock. When I'm fishing shallow docks, though, I want to stay a little bit further away. I want to make sure my presence isn't as known, especially if I'm fish are on tilt. 
You got a high pressure system, a lot of fishing pressure, a lot of boating pressure in the summer, a lot of waves coming in. I just want to make sure I'm not going to let them know I'm there. I'm going to approach the dock a lot slower, figure out what I want to do before I even get there, and then do it to the best of my ability. So with shallow docks, typically I stay further away and plan my attack and then go do it. On a shallow dock, the bass are usually going to be a little bit easier to find because there's not as much water there for them. And typically, you're going to dial in some unique stuff about each dock. And each dock is different. There are a billion different types of layouts for these docks. But the dock you roll up on today, let's say this one, you've got a couple different variations there. You've got a little platform out front with four poles all around it. That's a perfect place for fish to be in a somewhat of a wooden cage there where he has cover all around him and shade above. And then as you go down further, you got these taller boat slips, a little bit more water. You got some poles headed back to the shallow bank. A lot of different stuff on the dock, but you can kind of pinpoint where those fish are going to be because the water's not as deep. So that's a, that's a good thing about that. It can hurt you in that they can see you a lot easier, but they're a little bit more predictable in, in shallow water than they are in deep. And when you're going to stay away, when you're going to try to attack this dock, skipping may be critical because they may be tucked way up under it, getting in the best shade they've got, and you can't make a bait pitch right to the front and fall a long ways to call them out like you can in deep water. So you may need to get tight with skipping, whether that's a shaky head, a Senko, a fluke, whatever. Skipping may be really important to get way back up under there where nobody else can get on this shallow pressure dock, especially in something like summertime when it's real hot and fish are real angry. They really don't want to come out and eat. You got to hit them in the nose with it. You need to learn how to skip. If you're going to fish docks, point blank, you need to learn how to skip. With deep docks, it's similar but different. And I'll explain about that. You can adjust the rate of fall for your bottom bouncers or your fall baits, your drop baits, to the depth. So if you're going to drop, you know, if you know those fish from fishing or from buddies saying, oh, they're on the front of the docks. If they're on the front of the docks, you don't want something that falls a foot a second. You know, you're going to want to attack it a little bit faster than that. You're going to want that 3 16 to quarter ounce shaky head if you're trying to fish the front of the docks in 15 to 20 feet of water. That's kind of going to be a little bit more efficient than throwing a Senko that's weightless out there and letting it fall for a minute and a half. Especially if it's windy at all, you're never going to get them. So you need to adjust the rate of fall for your baits, whether that's with the action, with the weight, or the style based on what depth you're attacking the most. And you may not know when you first roll up on a dock. You may have to figure it out. Oh, they're on the back. Oh, they're on the front. Oh, they're in the boat stalls. And once you figure that out, you can pattern that better with your tackle. But on a deep dock, a deeper dock, there are many more bait options. With this, you can run a deep diving crankbait. You can run a jig. You can run a top water up shallow or around the shade. You can just fish anything. Anything you like to fish at 15 feet of water around cover, you got it right here. Now, again... The proximity of the dock is up to you, but if you really need to push a drop shot and talk these fish into eating on these vertical poles out front 15 feet of water, you can lay right up next to the dock. Probably ain't going to be too worried about you in 15 feet deep if you're up above them, and it'll let you be more accurate with your depth finder. You can lay it right over top of the fish, figure out, you know, is he approaching it, is he not, are there fish down there, is there not. So a deeper dock kind of allows you to use your electronics, slide up there, take a look at the dock, feel like how you need to approach it. It's up to you. I still stay a little bit off, but if I know I need to go up there and vertical fish, I'm going to roll right up on it and figure out how to do it. With these deeper docks, with this extra real estate under these docks, the bass can be harder to find. They can be laid right up shallow, two feet down suspended. They can be tucked up under the shade near the bank, or they can be suspended kind of cruising out around those vertical poles. They got a lot more room to move around, so it can be harder to find them. But typically, bass on docks, when you pattern them, it stays locked because these docks are very stable. But figuring that out can be a pain. And again, skipping can be real critical. So again, if you're going to fish docks at all and you own a spinning reel, learn how to skip. It'll help you out a lot. The next question was we talked about seasonal with water temperature. So in general, as a rule, in general, this is how it all works. Now, again, there's stuff that bucks the tradition. A lot of different lakes have a lot of different reasons why stuff could buck the tradition, either vegetation or temperature from a heated lake like Lake Norman, current, whatever. But typically, just think about docks as another piece of cover and how that all changes with bass in seasons. 
So again, in summertime with the 4th of July crazies on this dock, you would think a deeper dock would be better because the fish don't want to be laid up there in 90 degree heat. They're going to be tucked down suspended or they're going to be laying up in the shade. Most of the time, they're not going to be up in the sunshine in two feet of water unless they run in bluegill, but that's a whole different story. For the general rule, you want to fish deeper in the summer, just like offshore, just like steep banks, deeper in the summer because there's a cool layer of oxygen down there those fish want to be in, and they're going to follow that around until they find cover. Oop, here's a 15 to 18 foot dock. I'll lay up right here. Think about that. In the fall, everything switches. That air temperature cools off. The cool water on top starts mixing and falling into the cool water below in the column, and the fish move around. They're a lot more free. There's oxygen everywhere. The water temperature ain't so damn hot. They're going to go wherever they would like to go. So in the fall, we start beating up the shallows. Same deal. Go find a dock, stable dock, comfortable dock, main channel near a creek where you think shad are going to roll through and they can stage up on it and go fish it. They could be laid all the way up at the walkway in the fall. When that water temperature gets below 70, you know, 75 to 70, those fish go bananas and they feed all the way till about 50. So you got a good couple of months there to try to figure out if those fish are on shallow docks or deep docks, but you can start trying up shallow in the fall. In the winter, when we do get broke hard winter and it's 45 to 50 degree water, usually around here in Charlotte, that's December to January to February, I typically stay deeper. Those fish pull out real deep. They don't want to be in that super cold surface water. So deeper stable docks typically end up being, you know, the ones you go fish. Fish slow baits on the bottom, slow falling baits around them. Fish subtle lures, things like that. But you're typically going to lay up deeper. You really, in the wintertime, are not going to roll up into a two or three foot dock. You could, again, buck the tradition. A couple fish will do that. But predominantly, the fish are going to be laid up deeper. Springtime, no question there, go shallow. Every fish that's an adult that's going to make babies has to go shallow at some point between March and May. So if you're in spring, you want to fish a dock, run shallow. Odds are there'll be a male or female waiting on you. Sky condition. We do this again. We do this with everything. With docks, it's a little more important because a dock is an overhead piece of cover, whereas a tree, vegetation, a rock pile, things of that nature aren't as much. They're more of a, a beside the fish cover or under the fish cover or around the fish cover. Docks are always above them. So the sun, the clouds make a huge difference. In bright sunshine, bass are usually going to be super tight to cover, just like docks, and the strike zone is smaller. They ain't going to want to run out there in the bright stuff. They're going to be tight to that shade line or way up under the dock. So you need to look for the shadows no matter how small. You would be surprised. You can throw a bait in the sunlight six inches beside the shade and then in the shade and get bit. It's crazy how much they relate to the shadows. So try to find all your shadows and that will obviously change as the sun moves. So in the morning, you're going to have big old fat shadows off one side and in the middle of the day, they're going to all be about gone and late in the evening, they're going to be on the other side. So follow your shade, especially on your bright, sunny, high pressure days and you'll get bit more around docks. In sunshine, your bait should be able to cast accurately and stay in the strike zone. Remember, these fish ain't going to want to come out. They're going to be tight and angry, but they're going to be opportunistic. If something comes in there around the shade or under the dock and they don't have to move out to eat, they usually eat. So try to get the baits in there and keep them around the fish as much as you can, whether that's a worm, a drop shot, a slow fall in Senko, um, a, a, a retrieval bait like a crankbait or wake bait or something like that, a, a spinner bait, a swim jig, something you can keep in that shadow as long as you can to draw a fish strike is, is important. And again, skipping is paramount. I'm not going to keep reminding you about skipping. Learn how to skip. Overcast and cloudy days, the bass are going to be a little bit more loose and have a wider strike zone. So they're going to be moving around that dock. They'll use that dock as a base camp and as a place to go hunker down, but they are also not limited by that bright sunshine as to moving around. They'll be, again, as I said before in this example, I've had a day on Lake Norman where the fish were between the docks, hitting a spook in the middle of the, between the docks on the naked bank. We tried the docks, it wasn't working. We were just moving from dock to dock, slung a spook out, I caught a fish, he caught a fish, we started running the gaps. So don't eliminate anything until you've tried it. 
the structure on the dock will be more important than the actual shade now because the sun's not a factor. So a dock with good beams, a dock with a brush pile will be key because the fish don't necessarily have to hunker under the dock just because of the sunlight. You find one with stuff under it, it's a better dock. Moving baits, obviously top water and bottom baits will all be productive. They'll be more likely to come out and be aggressive, especially if pressure's good and low. Not a real ton of wind so you can approach the dock you know, properly. And skipping is not near as critical. We just said the fish has a bigger strike zone. You just need to get it near them and hopefully they're aggressive enough to bite. But think about the sunshine versus the clouds when you approach the dock as well. <clears throat> and these are the dead giveaways. Most of the time on all these lakes, you'll have a percentage of them that like to fish, the, 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 the homeowners. And most of them have Christmas trees in their house and they'll bring them down to the dock and they'll tie a rope to them or they'll tie a brick to them or whatever and they'll drop them by their dock. So when you're fishing docks, keep an eyeball out, especially like I said, up there around the walkway in the back of the dock where they quote unquote think you can't see it and try to find these brush pile areas that people have created. These are two Christmas trees in the top picture. That's what I look for on Lake Norman. Water super clear. If you see one, odds are there's three or four under there. Mark the dock figure out how to approach it either that day or later because there are going to be fish there at some point as long as there's enough water under it. And rod holders. A lot of people don't think about this. When you see rod holders all over a dock everywhere spread out, it may not be an indication there's anything going on. However, when you roll up on a dock and you see a lot of rod holders in one spot, in one direction, dude might have a net up there, dude might have a cleaning table up there, he's got a brush pile somewhere. He's put it out there so he can go out there in the evenings after supper, throw a few rods out on that brush pile and try to catch some catfish or crappie or whatever. I look for raw holders on the dock to see if they're all pointed the same way or if they're spread way out. Just a couple of tips you can use. Dredge docks, again, we talked about this earlier. This is actually Lake Norman in the, in the Blythe Landing Cove. And you can see this from Google Earth. Technology is incredible use, you know, for fishermen now. But you can see these dredges, and these are important because what these dredges do is they offer a different change in depth that's not normally there for these fish to use. And on Norman in particular, I've had days where fishing the dredges was the best thing going. And this is typically what you know, it's going to look like you'll have, and the reason you have these dredges is so these boats can get in and out of their stalls because the water is so flat. There's hardly any depth in the areas. The topo is super flat, and that's why the lower end of Norman is like that. So you'll have this one to three foot natural depth there where they built these docks, and then they're like, okay, Duke, or whoever the facility, you know, planner is, we need access to our dock with our pontoon or ski boat, and they'll come and cut them what we call an access dredge. And that's what that looks like. So you basically only have cut out the dirt around where the boats will be manipulated. Everything else is still flat dirt a foot deep. But there they have cut them a boat slip pathway, basically. In turn, that's going to be the deepest water around that dock. And it's a small, confined space that's easy to find because typically it's lined with white PVC pipes or wooden flags or whatever to let the people back in that boat out know where they can and can't go before running the ground. If you can start running dredges and figure out these spotted bass or these largemouth are holding in them, they're easy to find, they're easy to repeat. Typically the fish in there will be biting because they don't want to leave that house. That's where they want to be. It's a little cooler, they're a little more hidden. You drop a worm or a shaky head or Ned rig in there, liable to get beat. So another thing to think about is dredges. So in summary, before we skip on to jigs, with docks, they can definitely be fished all year round. Think of them as another piece of cover you have to figure out, but seasonally you can fish them all year round. Typically, typically, the deeper the better because it gives you a lot more options and a lot more opportunities for that fish to be around that dock if he's preferring a different depth, a different cover, a different temperature, a different forage base. The deeper the dock, the more options you have, so quote unquote, the better it is. I'm not going to tell you what baits to throw on a dock. All y'all are fishing baits you enjoy, you're comfortable with, you know how to fish well, so attack the parts of the column with your comfort baits you like. Everybody has a crankbait they like, everybody has a topwater they like, 
Everybody has soft plastics they like. Take what you're good with and push those docks with them. And if you're still having trouble and other guys are catching a ton of fish off of them, try to figure out why. Is it necessarily the color of the worm they were using or is it the technique they were using and where they were putting the bait? Most of the time it's presentation. It's not necessarily what brand of shaky head worm they were throwing, but try to figure out why fish were caught on a dock and you weren't doing it. It's not necessarily the name brand of the bait. It's how it was being done. But let all the variables we talked about, the sun, the depth, the water temperature, the structure under the dock, whether it's floating, whether it's fixed, help you break it down and make good decisions. You can all do this. You all do this anyway when you roll up on a dock. I'm trying to help you refine it and put the why in there to catch more fish on docks because it's a lot of fun. And learn to skip. Oh, almost, that's the last time I'm going to say it. Learn to skip docks. Get your spinning rod. You can do it with a bait caster, but if you don't know how to skip yet, get your spinning rod first. Either put you a Senko, a Fluke, or a shaky head on there and learn to skip a dock. Learn to get that bait at least the direction and the velocity you want, and then we'll talk about figuring out how to approach the cast and how to fish the cast back in You know, once the bait's in there. But you got to learn how to skip if you're going to fish docks good because I'm telling you, most of the boys out there are doing it. If you're going to follow behind somebody who's doing it, he's going to mop them up. So you need to learn how to skip. And go practice, guys. There's tons of docks. All our lakes around here pretty much for the most part are loaded with docks, especially on the lower ends of the lakes because that's where most of the residential stuff is. So pick a lake, pick a bank, go beat some docks up. At least get comfortable breaking them down and approaching them. And you never know, you might run into a pattern you didn't know you loved. I enjoy fishing docks. They're prevalent. They usually hold fish around here, and they like the baits I enjoy fishing. So we are going to leave docks, and we're going to go to jigs. So again, in the intro to this, I talked about that we're going to break down the jigs themselves. I'm not necessarily going to dive headfirst into how you should fish all these, because once you get them in your hand, you're going to fish them different than I am, and I'm going to fish them different than you are. And that's okay. That's great. I just want to prepare you with tools and you go out there and put them to work because your lake and my lake may be different and your style of fishing and mine might be different. But we're going to talk about what makes them cool, what makes them work, and we're going to start it right now. So <clears throat> what I wanted to show was these are all jig fish. And I'll be honest with you, I don't catch a ton of fish on a jig. But when we do they're this quality of fish and I think that's the allure of a jig is it's a big fish magnet um, it's a bigger profile it's a bigger meal but to me if I'm trying to put a big one in the boat there's only gonna be a handful of things I can feel like I can do that with on a consistent basis and one of them is most definitely a jig so numbers aren't really my concern we worried about these pigs we worried about the size so if you don't really like fishing jigs, if you've been hindering yourself in fishing jigs, you don't really get comfortable with it, I urge you <laughs> to try to get comfortable with it because this is what can happen. And I'm not an expert jig fisherman, guys, by far. I've only been doing it about three or four years, hardcore, really hard. And uh, the proof is in the pudding, man. It In the springtime especially, it's probably the best thing you have in your hand. But anyway, I'm going to show you my big girl. We'll do a title. I'm not. It'll say three, and this two, is a nine pounder it, that I caught a few well, years back. And it was probably, I don't know, oh, the first year I really, really hardcore fished a skirted jig over top of soft plastic. Oh, oh. And I had been dabbling with an Arky jig. <laughs> Holy. Holy. <laughs> figured out that they were on it that day. And we had a heck of a day oh, that God, day, that including this nine oh, pounder. So stoked that to catch that fish. That's got to be uh, over eight. Excited that's I had my family with me that day. That's like huge. And, uh, yeah, I, I think we had 31 pounds in our biggest five that day. It, this is the best day of fishing in my what life. Caught all my fish on a jig. <laughs> Just a phenomenal day. That is uh, it's a picture over there. That's the jig I was throwing. Using a pit boss junior as a trailer. No, I told you I don't. No, I don't. Yeah, just an epic day. Look at are you still alive? Yeah.
Oh my goodness. So, first thing we're going to go over is a flipping jig, because that's what she ate. And that's what most people think about when they think about jigs. This is actually a flipping jig. Again, we're going to break these things down. And fortunately, now everybody can get on Tackle Warehouse and other uh, tackle retail shops, and you can buy these naked jigs now. Used to be you had to make them to get them naked. Otherwise, you'd have to buy one, de-skirt it, de-collar it and everything, and then do it yourself. But now enough people are trying to build these themselves that you can go buy them just naked all you want. So a flipping jig's anatomy, first to start off, it's usually going to have a stronger hook. Three to five alt hook or bigger. I have seen some big ones. But typically, they're going to be a thick shank, strong hook. And the reason why is what I just showed you a couple slides ago. It catches hogs. The weed guard's going to be thicker as well there because you're coming through a lot more cover, a little, little bit more thick, bushy, brushy, woody color, cover with this jig. And we're trying to protect that hook from getting hung up before we put it in a fish. So the weed guard's usually a little bit thicker as well. The hook eye itself is typically in a 60-degree angle. And that is a universal angle to let the bait not only kind of stay on the bottom and dredge when you drag it or slow crawl it, but also to hop it. And, you know, most of them are between three eighths and three quarters of an ounce. Now you can go smaller and they can go bigger, but that's typical. And again, the arrow showing there the upward shaped head under the eye there, that scoop shaped head allows for that jig to come over most types of color. This is like an all terrain jig. It's not necessarily a specific jig for different types of cover, which we're going to talk about in a minute. This is an all-terrain jig that comes through just about everything. <coughs> the last thing, or two things there, it's got a deeper skirt collar, which we'll show you some other ones soon, for holding more skirt material, because typically you're a bulky skirt kind of jig when you're talking about a flipping jig, and you need a good skirt collar there to hold whatever you're using to put your skirt on with, whether it's a little rubber band, whether you're hand tying it, whatever, but we're needing to hold a little bit more bulky skirt, and then we need a good bait holder to hold that creature bait, that crawl, that chunk on there to, to have our good trailer. So if you're going to break down the flipping jig, this is where it starts. And then we go to skirts. Uh, most skirts on the jig are put on with a skirt collar, like the far right picture there. Basically just a black rubber band, super tight, super thick. Um, most jigs we buy nowadays already have a skirt on them, but it's getting more and more popular to sit at a table and do it by hand. Um, I know there is a ton of local guys to just about every body of water um, or every region that, that do it themselves. Little small tackle shops, little guys online now with the internet being so prevalent that are selling hand-tied jigs. And in my opinion, it's the best way to go. It's a little bit more money, but it's the best way to go because... The skirt collars on those other jigs are dry rotting. Sun hates them. Um, they just don't hold up through a lot of use. Whereas, I mean, you'll pretty much pull the fibers out of this hand tied jig before the 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 uh, or the jig film, the skirt filaments themselves before you tear up that actual tie material if it's done well in quality. Um, I've I've recently over the past two years stepped into hand tied jigs, and I highly highly recommend it. But if you want to find some hand tied jigs and you look just a little bit, you'll find some. For trailers, this is a personal preference, but all I did was break these up into chunks on the left and crawls or creatures on the right. This is the two most popular styles of trailers for flipping jigs. The chunks are going to add less bulk to the jig because they're not run all the way up to the skirt. Most of the time they're pierced through the pad itself with the hook. So they're not adding a lot of buoyancy to the bait. They're just adding some kind of action on the end or some silhouette of a crawfish. And then they're better in cold water. So when a jig don't need to be flapping crazy and going all over the place, it just needs to be subtle and lifelike looking with very little action, like in colder water, a chunk can be better. On the other side, the crawlers or the creature baits, they're going to add the bulk and the action to the jig. So if you need it to fall slower, if you need it to have some type of movement on the fall, if you want it to be swimming through the water when you wind it in or pump it, this is when you're going to want to go with a crawler or a creature. To name the three real quick for you in case you're shopping right now, the one on the left there is a Zoom Ultra Vibe Speed Crawl. The one in the middle is a Berkeley Pit Boss Junior. And the one on the right is a Zoom 
Z crawl. So those are kind of my staples for chunks and crawls. Oh, I'm sorry. The chunks on the left are a zoom um, super, let's see, super chunk or super chunk junior. And then the regular zoom salty chunk, which is a, a really good one to be honest with you in cold water to bulk up a jig that zoom super that that big fat chunk there is a super good one for that and so yeah great here's an example of what both of them kind of look like when you run a chunk on the left there and when you run a full bore trailer on the right you can see on the left with the chunk the jig body itself is pretty hollow in the middle from the jig head down to the chunk there's not much in there but skirt material and hook which that's all there is Whereas on the other side, you have that whole body of that Strike King Rage Crawl filling up that jig body, adding more bulk, adding more buoyancy, and adding more profile to that bait. And action, of course, with, this, with the uh, Rage Crawl tails. So just showing two different styles of a flipping jig. Both of the flipping jigs, they look different based on what trailer you add. If I had to basically give some universals for your combo a 6.6 six to a 7.6 medium heavy or heavy more backbone than tip you're having to set that big hook really hard through that weed guard into that fish that could possibly be a trophy size fish I want a little bit heavier rod medium heavy to heavy if you like fluorocarbon I wouldn't go any lighter than 15 most guys do 17 to 20 just be careful with doing light fluorocarbon it can get brittle it doesn't have a lot of stretch. It'll snap. Uh, not because of abrasion, but because of force and, and strength of fish versus strength of hook set, all that. Just be careful with floor if you're going to flip with it. Make sure you have beefy enough line. Braid, again, 20 to 50 pound. I wouldn't go any lighter than 20. It's just too fine. It can get nicked. It can get scratched. Um, I use 30 pound Power Pro Braid. For my jigs and I'm not catching tanks all the time guys most of the time I'm catching two to five pound fish so you're in Florida you're in Texas you may jump up if you're in you know Virginia New York a little further up where you're not catching as big a fish you know you could probably go down a little bit but I like 30 it works for me the reel is not super important a lot of guys think it is in my opinion it's not I need a reel with a good smooth tight drag and enough capacity for some bigger line. If you're gonna go up to 20 pound fluorocarbon, it's very thick, it's gonna take up a lot of capacity in the reel, so just make sure your reel can do it. Again, like I've said before in previous classes, the reel is the last thing you buy. Get the jig, get the rod, get the line first, then go pick out your reel. And I know it sounds backwards, but that's how you do it to do it right. So get a reel that you enjoy with a big enough capacity and a sweet drag, and you're good to go. So this is a video showing what a mop jig looks like with a Pit Boss Junior on it on the bottom. Like I said, I'm not going to tell you how to fish your jigs. You're going to fish your jigs differently than I am because you're in a different place than I am. But this is what it looks like when you're retrieving a jig. This is a mop jig and this is a Pit Boss. And you can see how those skirt flare out and then it tightens up when he moves the bait. So that is trying to mimic a scurrying away crawfish with vertical hops. So that's short repetitive hops, whereas this next spot is a jig with a fight and crawl trailer on it that's short erratic hops. So you can kind of see how that bait undulates through the water and whether or not the fish want that. A little bit more um, movement instead of sitting still kind of deal. And it's just, you know, you can retrieve your crawl any way you want, but this is just showing you what those look like underwater. There he is. We'll see him again real quick into the water crawl bait standing up we're doing short little erratic hops so he's trying to run away but then he's defending try to run away but then he's defending and that might be what the fish like you won't know till you try it <clears throat> finesse jigs this is becoming one of my favorite genre of jigs um on the top left there it's a war eagle heavy finesse jig the bottom left that's a strike king bitsy flip and on the right it's new z-man skirted uh ned head jigs which you know, the Ned head is taken off over here and pretty much everywhere. Now we're getting skirted options, different style, different look for the Ned rig, but something fun to play with. Typically, if we're talking about finesse jigs, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at a lighter wire hook, typically a one aught to a three aught, depending on brands. Um, 
the weed guard is usually a little softer. I know this one looks as long, but it's usually a softer, finer material. Um, and that's because your hook shank is not as thick. So you need to make sure you can plow it home through it. Hook eye, again, is typically a 60 degree angle to be a little bit more universal, not straight, not directly up, kind of in the middle. More often than not, they're between an eighth and a quarter ounce. You will see some three eighths, things like that, but typically they're a lighter head. Smaller head design, either round, bullet shaped, what have you. It's a smaller head, <clears throat> and it's usually got a lighter bait holder because the whole package is trying to stay small and light, and you're not usually using big, great, big, bulky trailers. Again, with the skirt collar, it's also a little bit smaller because you're usually not adding huge, thick skirts to this. It's a little more simpler, subtle presentation. Um, again, you see the uh, Strike King. That's actually the Bitsy Bug jig there now on the left. You can tell by the finer weed guard on it versus the Bitsy Flip. But the skirt material is real fine. It's real small. It's real dainty. It's not bulky. You're bulging out. It's just pointed straight back down at the hook. And it's just ready for another little trailer to add to it to make it a nice little subtle crawfish presentation. Most finesse jigs have this collar popped skirt in the middle here where the material is not bent over double over the jig. It's just hanging straight down with a little bit of fluff at the top to emulate that crawfish tail presentation. And again, tons of different skirts, tons of different colors and, and all that. But again, hand tying <clears throat> like this one right here is the way to go for durability and customization. Pick out some colors you like, talk to the guy making them or make them yourself and get you a, a jig head you're really comfortable with and make your own baits, guys. It's a cool new way of doing a craft for catching fish is tying your own jigs because the materials are out there and they're not expensive. So if you get into jig fishing, you get good at it, odds are you're gonna get jigs you like and then you're gonna wanna try new things. Hand tying them yourself is a way to do it. So for trailers with finesse jigs, again, I've broken them up the same way, chunks and tubes this time versus cross creatures and grubs. <coughs> Excuse me. On the left, your chunks and your tubes are going to add less bulk, less action, and better in cold water. So what we've added here is a zoom um, little tube, and I like to do that for smallmouth in the New River up in North Carolina. What I'll do is I'll run a small tube up on my jig because it's really subtle. It doesn't cause the bait to flutter or anything like that, but it looks like a little natural crawl body sticking out the back of the jig. So that's a little trick for you. If you can find a tube you like and you're fishing smallmouth in a river and you want your jig to look extremely subtle and natural, it's a good a good technique to try. On the right, we've added a couple new baits here. We've, we've added some, some grubs and we've added the ever popular, you know, um, brush hog that's a tiny brush hog though instead of a uh, baby or a full-blown brush hog but for finesse jigs these are super good little trailers that's a tiny pack of crawl on the left a zoom tiny brush hog in the middle that's a caitlin's grub in the in the third position and on the fourth that's a zoom creepy crawly tail so what that's going to do again is add more action to the bait let it fall slower and add some bulk and help it swim through the water column so this is what finesse jigs look like with a couple of those trailers. Um, the trailer there in the, in the middle with the bright uh, green, that's a zoom, let's see, that is a zoom baby, let's see, little critter crawl. That's what that one's called. Very natural, very little action. Doesn't add a ton of bulk to the bait, but it looks real natural. Um, the bottom left shows that Ned rig head that's skirted with a, uh, a little tube there. So you can see how that pokes out of the jig and it looks real good and natural and clean but not a ton of action and then on the right just the opposite we've got a twin tail grub so it's going to add a bulk and add a lot of flapping action to that jig with finesse jigs this is kind of where i live when i'm fishing for smallmouth that are usually on the two pounds or less pound and a half or less <clears throat> i'm actually using a six six medium rod but if you're going to be in an area where you can catch three to five pound fish you can go up to a medium heavy as tall as you want but for me, when I'm throwing a smaller jig and I'm trying to manipulate it, I am looking at a half tip, half backbone rod, a little bit lighter, softer rod. And that's mainly to manipulate the jig, to pitch the jig well, cast the jig well, let it load up properly and, and you know, fish the bait like I want to before I need to set the hook. 12 to 15 pound fluoro, the lightest I've ever gone with a jig is 12. I don't know that I want to go to 10. Personally, I'm a... 15 man but 12 will work on a finesse jig on smaller fish if you're not cranking them through cover 
Most of the time, again, I'm throwing, you know, 15 pound fluorocarbon or 30 pound braid. It's where I live. It's where I love it. Um, there's just a chance you can stick a big one on a small jig, especially in the winter time. So just be careful with your choices, but the heavier the line, the harder it is for that finesse jig to fall through the water column. Just keep that in mind too. Again, get you a good reel with a good drag. Capacity is not as big a deal here because you're not using that huge 85 pound braid or that 25 pound fluorocarbon. Um, just get a reel that does the job for you with the line you need and the drag you need. If you're worried about the gear ratio, that's fine. Most of this work's done with the rod and not the reel. So get a rod you like, get the line you need, and get a reel that'll actually clean it all up for you. So this is a G-Man balling out jig by Buckeye with a young Christy Crow on it. We're gonna show you. So you see the skirt itself is not ballooning. It's got the little collar pop like I talked about. And the rest of the skirt from the the, uh, the weed guard back is just laid down against the jig. Real subtle, not a lot of bulge, just a little bit of color and body action with that skirt. And then whatever trailer you like. Like I said, he happened to have a Christy Crawl on here, but that finesse jig doesn't put out that big bulge. The guy had the blue gill or whatever it was, jumped all over. It. It's like a green sunfish or something. That's a, that's a rock bass. Looks like it's a rock bass. But, um, so yeah, the trailer is just based on whether you need it to go slow and swim like that or be real subtle and have no action. And that's all personal preference and water clarity for that matter. So we're going to go to football jigs now, and you'll see that special case down there on the left here in a minute. But a football jig is their name so because of its head design, and they were designed to crawl through rocks. That's what a football jig was built to do. A lot of guys fishing offshore, fishing points, fishing rock beds up in the Midwest, they wanted a jig that would do that and not stay hung up and, and bury its nose in between rocks. Here comes a football jig. It's usually got a heavier strength hook, two alt, four alt thereabouts. Weed guard's kind of medium because a lot of times you've made a real, real long cast with this bait and you can't take up as much line as strongly. So the weed guard don't need to be quite as strong because most of the time you're fishing this over open water without any trees or bushes. The weed guard's typically kind of recessed into the football a little bit to keep the line from getting so beat up on rocks. Sometimes it ain't, sometimes it is. I don't know that I've seen where I have a preference in either one, but I think it's a super idea, pretty creative. But um, 60 degrees again to come through that cover instead of drag straight through it or hop over it, you want to be able to kind of glide over it whenever you want, raise that rod tip up a little bit to get it over the rock. Most of the time, since you're fishing on the bottom hard, most of the time these are 3 8 up to an ounce. Um, Old, old fishing buddy always told me, if you think you've gone heavy enough with your football jig, go one step heavier. And that means you'll stay on the bottom longer, which is a good idea. But um, just most of them are a little heavier so they can stay down better. Again, head design's unique. It's an oval football shaped to come through the rocks better. Here you could have a bulky skirt and you could have a big old trailer fishing offshore. So a deeper skirt collar and a good bait holder are key on this bait. And again, going back to skirts, same deal. Throw whatever you want on there. Get it hand tied. Get a good skirt collar, whichever. Typically with the football jig covering water a lot and a lot of action offshore, you're looking at the bulkier trailers. You're usually not throwing chunks. You want a lot of action, a lot of movement, a lot of bulk to call fish in from a long way or on rocks. Usually you're always, always, always mimicking crawfish instead of like bluegill and shad and such. So... If you're going to do nothing but drag it, you need to have some kind of action. There's tons of different ones. Again, that's a pack of crawl on the left. That's a zoom creepy crawly tail on the second stall. Third stall is a Strike King Rage Bug, which is an excellent creature bait. I have nothing but good things to say about that bait. And then at the end there, you have a Strike King Rage Crawl, which is a very popular bait as well. All of them work great. They'll just look different in the water. <coughs> With this... Your rod and reel needs to be able to throw a long ways, fish a long ways, and stay down. Plus, you need to be able to catch up all that line and set the hook good if you hit a big one way out there at the beginning of your cast on a long point, on a big flat, whatever. So, seven to seven and a half, medium heavy to heavy. I think a longer rod with more backbone is important to launch that big old heavy jig out there, fish it appropriately on the bottom, and hammer a fish out there a long ways. Could be overkill, 
but I don't see it being a problem with seven and a half foot rod fishing a football jig offshore or on long points. Again, I don't go below 15, 17 pound fluorocarbon in this arena either because you could hit a big one offshore. You're coming through a lot of rocks. Your line could get nicked up a lot. Again, 20 to 30 pound braid is as low as I would go. Again, I'm running 30 pound braid. My jig rod does everything for me. So I usually run 30 pound Power Pro and go with it. I ain't had it fail me yet and I'm enjoying it so far. Same deal with the reel. Capacity is not as necessary. You're usually not throwing, you know, big, huge flipping line, but you need a good drag. With this, the reel could be important if you're going to be using a different technique, which is coming up after we see this football jig right here. This is the action of a football jig dragged through rocks, which is, again, why this bait was designed the way it is and why it's become a favorite for guys fishing rock beds, rock points, things like that. Again, this is a V&M flat line with a V&M wild thing, but any flap and crawl bait will have a similar approach to this. Notice he's not really pulling that jig vertically any time unless he lays up on a rock and has to hop it over. Most of the time, he's doing his best to keep that jig right down there on the bottom in those rocks. And that's the type of technique and retrieve this bait was designed to do. So, football jig, think rocks. Football jig, think keeping it down and dragging it. Football jig, think action in the trailer to call fish to it. This is a special case. This is a swing head jig, and these have just come around in the last three to five years. Um, it, it's basically a football head on a swing wire clasp hooked to an EWG hook. There are a thousand different ones of these now. There originally was only one, and that was the hard head jig made by Tommy Biffle for Gene LaRue Bates. He designed this as a fishing system, which we'll go over in a minute. But basically, it was a big old 4 aught EWG hook hooked to this wobbly head that is swinging the hook from it. Most of these are quarter to three quarters of an ounce. They do go bigger, they do go smaller, but most of the time a half ounce is where the money is. Um, again, the unique oval head design with the jointed wire loop makes this bait do what it does. These are the trailers you want to use with that bait. You can use a natural style trailer with no action. That's not what it was designed to do. The bait on the left there, the far left, is a Jean LaRue Biffle bug. That is a bug that Tommy Biffle designed to be put on the back of this bait. And I'll show you in a minute what that looks like, but a bait with a lot of action is what this thing was designed for. And it's designed to be using a crank retrieve, which we'll show in a second. The rod, treat it like a spinner bait rod, um, or a swim jig rod, I think, because you're moving a bait with your reel most of the time. And that sounds weird. You'll find out why in a minute. But you also need to hammer that weedless hook home. So it's a unique presentation. Again, I would think of it like a swim jig or maybe a spinner bait. Because when you're dragging that bait on the bottom and a fish takes it, you still need a lot of backbone to pound that hook home. The line's very similar to what we've been using all day. The gear ratio in the reel may be important. If you really get on this pattern hard and you trust in it and do it all day, the gear ratio will be important, and you'll realize why in a second. This is what it's supposed to look like. We are taking a jig head and attaching a trailer to it and cranking it on the bottom with this grinding style retrieve. It don't sound right, it sounds crazy. You would be amazed. And this is the LaRue Hardhead with the LaRue Biffle Bug. This is the original setup that was designed by Tommy Biffle for this style of fishing. Different type trailers will do good for you. Different heads will do good for you. But this is the baby that was built for this technique. And it looks insane on the bottom. Now, yeah, fish has got to catch up to this thing and eat it. But how do you think he's going to when he does? He's going to hit it wide open and hard, and you have to be ready to hammer it back. But that is a cool little runaway technique that looks like a crawfish getting out of dodge or some other type of creature. But to me, it looks like a crawfish scurrying, heading for high ground. And smallmouth in particular probably cannot handle this technique when you really get on. 
I don't know yet because I haven't been able to try that. But I know largemouth like it too. So that is what it's supposed to look like grinding on the bottom. So gear ratio, line strength, and head weight are critical to keep it down there. So we're going to go about bladed jigs now, or as most people call them chatter baits, because that was the original one that came out, and that is the chatter bait on the top left. That's the new and improved model with the cool clip now. One on the bottom um, is their new one, which uh, is like a Project Z chatter bait, and the one on the right is a custom chatter bait that you can get at most you know, tackle stores now, or you can build it yourself. Chatter baits, when they first came out, looked a lot like this. It's basically a spinnerbait jig head hooked to a crazy blade on an eyelet. Most of the time the hook is huge, 2 alt to 4 alt. It's straight shank. It's usually a, a, a nickel hook, spinnerbait hook. The, uh, the bait holder is usually non-existent on the old originals, and it never hardly had a good jerk collar. Um, like again, this is an old spinnerbait head mold that was designed. The Arky head design is typical of what you saw back in the day. Um, just a simple jig head design. Their most time are a quarter to a half an ounce. And the blade, the hexagonal blade with that snap is what created the action for this jig. So the original chatterbait is built like this, but you can do it. So the original chatterbait, the blade was actually hooked onto the eyelet itself through a small hole at the bottom. You can build a chatterbait yourself with these components right here on the right of the screen. You need a snap, you need a chatter blade, and you need split rings. You can buy all these components at multiple tackle retailers, online, lure building companies, whatever. And you can take any jig that you want, any jig that you want, and make it into a chatterbait. Or a bladed jig, as it were. Is your line... Or is your hook eye vertical or horizontal on the jig you want to use? If it's horizontal, you only need one split ring, which is the picture here you can see close up. If it's vertical, you need two split rings. One to put on the jig itself to start that horizontal piece, and then one for the blade to connect to it, just to keep everything flat and squared off. So you can make any jig into a chatterbait. And just like the one at the bottom right in this picture, looks just like an old flipping jig to me. Nice skirt collar, good big old hook, good weed guard, and somebody stuck a black chatter blade on it. That's all they've done to that. So think outside the box when you're talking about your chatter baits or your bladed jigs. The other three are new designs that people have come out with for the chatter or bladed shaker jig. The top one's a Molex, the bottom one's a Strike King, and the one on the right's a brand new Booyah style of chatterbait they developed. But there's a bunch of different bladed, vibrating jigs now that you could play with. But the old chatterbait original is the one that started it all. In clearer water, you're going to want your trailer to not do a whole lot to the bait. You want it to look natural, you want it to look clean coming through the water. I like a grub, I like a fluke, and a Zayco swim bait down there. That was built by Yamamoto just for chatterbaits. It looks good in the water, has a sick profile. All else fails, that's the one to do. On the right, if you're fishing dirtier water and you want more vibration to come out, it already puts a ton of vibration out, but you might want to pop the profile a little more and have something active on the back. A uh, Zoom Ultravibe Speed Worm is a good option. Cut it down if you need to. Have that tail straight out the back. Still looks like a fish tail in a singular mode, but has a lot of flap and a lot of action. Of course, a white twin tail grub is an excellent choice as well, or a Zoom Ultravibe Speed Crawl in white or chartreuse or whatever you're trying to mimic. A nice, tight, vibrating action off the back of the bait. <clears throat> Again, with a bladed jig slash chatterbait, I'm trying to be a little bit more accurate with my casting, so I don't use a huge old rod. I like a six footer, medium heavy for me, just like my spinner bait so I can roll it up next to cover accurately and pull it out like I want when I have to drive it around lily pads or docks or trees or whatever. But you do want plenty of backbone to drive that big old hook home. Um, the line's very similar to everything else. 15 to 17 pound fluoro, 20 to 30 pound braid. Just be comfortable in what you're doing and size it accordingly. Again, Texas versus New York's gonna be a little different. 
Gear ratio may be important here. You still need a good drag and your capacity is not near as necessary because your, uh, your line is not that huge. Get a gear ratio you're comfortable with. 6.2 to 1 is hard to beat. If you really know you're going to be burning the chatterbait a lot, slide up to 7.1. This is the original style chatterbait. shaking like crazy coming through veg coming through the column and those little booty feet are back there going bananas too but this thing is all about vibration and all about chattering so it's like a swim jig with an extra rattle that drives the fish nuts sometimes and let them know that he's coming super clear water i don't think it works as well stained to dirty water i think it has an advantage over just a swim jig it's a crazy bait that when it first got here was epic for fishing vegetation. So that's chatterbait. That's a noisy little quivering dude that's easy to fish, chuck and wide. We're going to talk about swim jigs now. That's Tom Monsoor in the picture there. and He's basically the founder of the feast when it comes to swim jigs. And that's his hand-tied jigs he's got there in his hand. He's been making them for 40 years, and he's caught a lot of fish on swim jigs. I've watched a lot of his videos and talks. Super nice guy. Gives you everything he's got. Real cool story about how he found the swim jig stuff out. On the top left, that's a Strike King KVD swim jig. It is my favorite by far. And uh, it's actually a Tom Monsoor swim jig on the bottom there, the white one. Swim jigs... Again, we'll have a decent two alt, four alt size hook, bigger, smaller, depending on the company, depending on the size of the jig. Weed guard's a little bit softer. This is because you're usually getting bit in the middle of a cast and you load into the fish rather than set the hook. So you want that fish to load up and get, get hooked without a whole lot of stop, point to the fish, hammer the hook back. You want to be able to load into the fish and get that hook point in him. Most of them between a quarter and a half ounce. They're obviously are bigger and smaller. Most time I sit with a quarter to a three eighths, depending on what I'm doing. If I'm coming through real thick grass and I wanted to get on down in there, I'll go up to a half. Most time I'm between a quarter and a three eighths. The head design is very unique for a swim jig. It's pointed. And then the line tie is usually right out the front and that's to pull it through grass. Instead of pulling them up, you're pulling them straight so you can come through that grass real easy. Good skirt collar again because you could be adding a bulky skirt. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on what kind of company you got with skirts. Depends on what you want it to look like. And typically it's got a really good bait keeper because most of the time you're using a trailer with a lot of action. And all you're doing is winding it all day. Chuck and wind, chuck and wind, chuck and wind. So you want that bait keeper to hold that trailer up very good so it swims appropriately every cast. The skirts you can use are very similar to the other jigs, except for now, if you want more action, you want more realism, you can come to these new skirts um, made by Do It Molds that have a lot more action built into the hub of the skirt. Um, you still hand tie, you can still use any kind of skirt you want, but just keep in mind that if you if you want to add a trailer to you know make sure your skirt doesn't cover up the action of the trailer, because uh, it's super, super important when you're just swimming a bait to make sure your trailer is uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing the whole way back to the boat. <clears throat> the two different retrieves for a swim jig are to hop the bait through the column all the way back, um, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down in a consistent motion, or a straight retrieve, just chuck and wind. With a hop, hop, hop retrieve, I want flat trailers that are going to displace water on the fall, and that way it'll hang in the water column a little bit more that look natural. That's a Zoom uh, Super Chunk Junior, probably, Super Chunk Junior in the top. Uh, Zoom Chunk in the middle, and a, uh, I think that's a, a beaver-style bait. I don't know if that's a Smalley Beaver or what, but something flat with flat paddle style, or style baits that'll help me from that bait falling so fast on the pumps. Versus a straight retrieve bait, something with movement. Um, my favorites are the um, Lake Fork Live Magic Shad there at the bottom of that block and the um, 
the slider grub, the Charlie Brewer slider grub there in the middle, the white grub with the green tail. I love that little guy on small finesse jigs um, that I'm going to swim. <clears throat> or the uh, single tail grub's great. A lot of people throw grubs. Ultravibe speed worm at the top is another one you can cut down to put a lot of movement. Or the Ultravibe speed crawl there, fourth one down, if you need a lot more slow drag to the bait. You can put whatever you want on the back of a swim jig. Just make it look like you need it to. Um, same kind of deal. I'm going to stay a little shorter, either six or six and a half feet, because I'm, again, wanting to be pretty accurate with my casts. I'm not really necessarily too worried about bombing a huge long cast with this. I'm usually fishing it in and around cover, whether it be laydowns or docks or things of that nature, grass, pads. So if you're fishing big, expansive, vegetative mats, like, you know, in Gunnersville or something like that, or... You know, down a really long point of grass, that's fine. You can go to a longer rod and do that. Most of the time, other than that, I'm going to be fishing a little bit more accurate casts around tight cover. So I want a little bit shorter rod. I like a 6.6 six in my opinion. Again, line's about the same. Just need to get the fish home. Need to make sure the line's strong enough for that. Again, make sure your drag is good. Capacity's not a huge deal. If you do fish slower with your hand, you may want a faster gear ratio. If you wind fast, you may want a slower gear ratio. Just get what works for you. Think about your spinner bait setup. Very similar to that, your spinner bait slash swim bait setup should be similar to your swim jig. And that's it, guys. I am done. Um, we'll go back to the beginning and stop this video. I hope you have learned something about jigs, how they're built, what the options are what you can do around docks now to break them down and think through them. If you need anything, if you need to find somebody can tie you some jigs, if you want a preference of my jigs, which ones to start using, companies to start trying to figure out if you like or not, any of that good stuff, you know where I am. Please find me on Facebook at Brostat Bass Class or just Dave Ferguson. Shoot me a question. I always answer any time, and I hope I've done you some good with docks and jigs. Be ready next time where we'll go over something new in Volume 5. I appreciate all y'all's support, and I hope I've taught you at least something to catch bass better. Y'all have a good one.